Good morning. Welcome to Edmonds Adventist Church Sabbath School. I'm John Brunt, pastor, and today we continue our series on how to interpret the Bible. We'll be in this series for 13 weeks from April through June. As we begin, let's ask God to be with us. Lord God, we are so grateful for the people that you have used down through the centuries to preserve your word for us, to give us the tools to help us understand it. And we pray that today you will guide us as we think about understanding your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me go back and catch up just a little bit on where we were last week. Remember, we talked about why there is a need for interpretation. We said that the Bible is easier to interpret than most people think, but that we do come across things that need some background information, for instance, just as when we read a news story, we might find elements that we're not familiar with and that we need to look something up, look up a name or a place. This becomes even more true with the Bible because we are simply further removed from it. We speak a different language. We live in a different culture. We live at a different point of history in the world. And so we started last week thinking about how the Bible came to us, about the differences in manuscripts and how up until the time of printing, manuscripts had to be hand copied. And then we looked at the problems of translation and the fact that what we read, of course, is a translated Bible and the translation is never an exact science, but that we are blessed with a multiplicity of translations that give us different perspectives and that use different principles. Some try to be very literal. Some try to be more like what the English would express if it were not a translation, but we're just getting across the same idea in modern language. And we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of those various kinds of translations. And we looked at a number of principles that help us choose a translation and know why we're using it, what we're using it for, and concluded that the best thing is to use more than one translation, but to use them intelligently, knowing what each translation is doing, what kind of principles of translation it's using, whether it's from the original language, and then enhance our study of God's word with a multiplicity of translations. So that's kind of where we were when we ended last week. Now I want to go on with some other principles for interpreting the Bible. The next thing I want to talk about is holistic understanding. I mentioned in the book that I wrote, Enjoying the Bible, on how to read the Bible, that whenever I started studying a book in a college class when I was teaching, I would always have students read the whole book in one sitting. And you know, it was amazing to me that every time I did that, students would respond you mean the whole book all at once? They weren't used to reading books of the Bible. They were used to reading verses in the Bible, which we so often do. Just a verse for this and a verse for that. We answer this question with a verse and that question with a verse. But I wanted them to catch the whole. For you see, these books were never written simply to be studied a verse at a time. They were written as books. Let, let's think of Paul's letters, for instance. When Paul wrote a letter to a church, he wasn't saying, uh, this letter is going to be a reference book that I hope you will put on the shelf and every now and then take down to uh, pick out a verse here and there. Of course, when Paul wrote it, there were no verses or chapters. It was simply a letter. And a person would carry it to the church and they probably read it on Sabbath morning in their worship service. And the people could only listen because there was no way Paul could say, stop by FedEx on the way and make a copy for everybody. So one person would read. That's true of all the things in the, New, the books in the New Testament. 
It's interesting, for instance, that in the book of Revelation, it begins with a blessing. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear. So it's assuming that one person is going to read it to the whole congregation all at once. So I would like to suggest that one of the best ways we can study the Bible is to read it holistically, to try to catch the whole. Now, you say, maybe there are things I won't understand. That's okay. Come back to those. But first, get it as a whole. In fact, I think that it is sometimes helpful perhaps not to just read it as a whole, but to listen as a whole, because that's how the original hearers would have heard it. Listen, you see, um, communication theorists tell us that the brain processes information differently when we catch it with the ear than if we catch it with the eye. The eye tends to analyze, look at the detail. But the ear only gets to hear it once as it goes by. And so the ear helps the brain synthesize and catch the whole. And I really believe that one of the things we miss most in our study of Scripture is this idea of catching the whole, understanding the whole book. Let me give you some examples of times that I have experienced the whole book and found it helpful. Uh, one thing I've done is I've memorized the book of Philippians. And in seminars and churches, a number of times I have recited the book of Philippians from memory so that I can actually look people in the eye. And I am amazed at how much attention people give and how many questions they have at the end, how well they do at hearing the whole message and capturing what Paul was trying to do. I went once to a uh, reading, actually, I guess you would call it, at the Kennedy Center in New York, uh, pardon me, in Washington, D.C. I was there for a convention, and there was an, a Shakespearean actor by the name of Alec McCowan, who was reciting the Gospel of Mark. Now, he did this six nights in a row in the Kennedy Center, and the night I was there, it was packed. And I was sitting back in the back because those were the seats I could afford. The least expensive seats were $25. They were up into the hundreds up near the front. And people filled that auditorium in the Kennedy Center six nights in a row just to hear the Gospel of Mark. That's all he did was recite the Gospel of Mark from memory. And you could have heard a pin drop. And I have to admit, I saw things in the Gospel of Mark that I had never noticed before as I read. Twice I've had the privilege of hearing someone recite the book of Revelation from memory, looking us in the eye, giving the whole book. And I was amazed what a different picture I got of the book of Revelation. Hearing that whole thing listening to the hymns that punctuate the book of Revelation around God's throne and realizing that this book was written for real people who were going through difficult times. And you get a different sense of the book, not just trying to figure out what this little symbol is and that little symbol, but a picture of the whole. So one of the principles of interpretation I believe is very important is listening to the whole, letting the ears try to synthesize everything before you go back and start looking at details that you might need some help on. Actually, you know, in the New Testament world, well, Old Testament world as well, in the biblical world, writing was quite different than it is now. You say it was obviously a culture where they wrote because 
uh, we have writings of the New Testament. But writings were not meant to be read in the way that we read them. Um, people who wrote something in that era never supposed that someone would curl up beside the fire and just enjoy reading it. You wrote so that it could be made alive in oral presentation. In that sense, writing in that era was somewhat like musical notation is for us. There are scores of music, but scores generally are not there so that you can just sit down and read the score. Few of us would go by the score of a Beethoven symphony and sit down by the fire and just read through the music. We would listen to the music. And the score is written down so that musicians can make it come alive to us in actual hearing. Well, probably no more than about 10% of the population were really literate. Now, they might write a few words and write their name and be able to read some minimal documents. But very few of the people in the day of biblical times actually were able to read and write the way we would think of being literate. So the scribes were important, and they were the ones who wrote it down, and they wrote it down so that it could be vocalized to a group, which means that originally the Bible was read in community, not individually so much. We live in a very individualistic society and don't realize that these books were originally shared in community. Now, oral cultures such as they were and written cultures such as we are actually come to the point of thinking in different ways. And one of the reasons I think we need to understand the Bible holistically and as whole books is to try to go back and capture the way they might have understood. Because in oral cultures, people understand much more pragmatically. Whereas we tend to see things more theoretically. We tend to categorize instead of thinking about the practical whole. Let me give you an example. There was a test given to try and judge the difference between oral cultures and written cultures. So it had to be a picture test because in the oral cultures people didn't read. But they gave this test with pictures and then asked people to choose a picture, kind of like a multiple choice test for pictures. Here's just one of those questions. Four pictures. A hatchet, a saw, a log, and an axe. Hatchet, saw, log, axe. The question was, which of these four does not belong? Now, in our culture, in written cultures, almost everyone would say that the log doesn't belong because the other three, hatchet, saw, and axe, are all implements. And we categorize them as implements. The log is something different. But in oral cultures, and there are oral cultures around the world still at this time, such as the biblical culture was, when they asked which one of those didn't belong, they said the hatchet. And ask why? They would say, well, you could cut that log with the saw, and you could cut that log with the axe, but that hatchet would be useless against that log, that size of log, so the hatchet doesn't belong. See how we're thinking in terms of categories, where in the oral society they're thinking in terms of just very practical, down to earth. You couldn't do anything with that log, with the hatchet. So I think there's really a value in getting back into the way 
the first hearers would have experienced the Bible by listening, listening as a whole. And by the way, remember last week I talked about Bible Gateway, which is a uh, uh, website, BibleGateway.com. And there are 50 some English translations there that you can go to. But in many of them, they also have an audio. You can go and just click on the audio and you can listen to books of the Bible. Uh, I did that with Colossians just this week in one of my devotionals. I just listened to the book of the letter, Paul's letter to the Colossians uh, on Bible Gateway. So there's an opportunity for you to listen to any book of the Bible that you wish to uh, as you go on that website. So that's the first principle I want to talk about today is catching the whole, trying to understand the whole book or the whole letter the way the first hearers would have experienced it. Not just as a reference book to put on the shelves, the way we so often think of the Bible. Let's move to a second element today, and that is understanding the words. After we choose a translation and we listen to the whole, we have to think about the individual words. What do they mean? Well, usually we don't have to do much thinking about that if we're just listening to uh, communication in English. But every now and then there'll be a word we don't know. And we have to go to a dictionary to look it up and see what that word means. Well, of course, the words that are being used in the Bible were from a different language and they have been translated for us. But it can be helpful to go back and understand how those words were used. Commentaries can help. There's always a danger of depending too much on commentaries rather than reading and listening for ourselves. But it is helpful to get background information on different words and how they're used um, in Bible dictionaries and in commentaries. Now, let me give you an example of a word that means more today to scholars and readers than it would have when the King James Version was translated because of archaeological discoveries that have been made since that time. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, what does that word substance mean? Well, the word translated substance was used in the philosophers to mean the substance or essence of something. But in the time of the New Testament, the word had come to be used in a very common, ordinary way. And they didn't know that until the discovery of all of these pieces of papyri that we've talked about before that just give us what would be found in a typical wastebasket, everything from love letters to grocery lists and deeds and so forth. And they found out this word translated substance is used in this common everyday material, not the way the philosophers used it, but in common everyday material to refer to the deed to a piece of property, the title that assures you that the property is yours. Now, the title is not the property itself, but the title assures you that you own the property, that it is yours. Well, they found out that that's what this word really means, is the deed. So, a lot of modern translations that you read, instead of saying, faith is the substance of things hoped for, will say, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the confident assurance. It's the deed that assures you that what you are hoping for is going to come true. So understanding the words, and as I say, Bible dictionaries and commentaries can help you there. And I find a great deal of help in using a concordance. Now, a concordance is different than a dictionary. A concordance takes a word and tells you all the places in the Bible where that word is used. 
The problem with most concordances is that they simply go by the English words. And it may be that even within a given translation, an English word might actually represent several different Greek words that in, the translators use the same English word to translate several different Greek words, or it may be that one Greek word is translated in five or six different ways, different uh, words used in the English translation. So I find it helpful to go back and find the original language, the Greek or the Hebrew, what is, how is that word used? How many different ways is it translated? How is it used in different passages? Because one of the keys to understanding what a word means is its usage. Now you say, how can I do that? I don't know Greek and I don't know Hebrew. Actually, you can, even though you don't know Greek and Hebrew. And you can do it with a website. It is Blue Letter Bible, all one word, blueletterbible.org. And let me tell you how to do it. Just log on to blueletterbible.org and up in the right-hand corner, there's a box where you can type in a verse, any verse you want or chapter in the Bible. And you can choose which translation. And again, like Bible Gateway, uh, Blue Letter Bible has lots of different translations there. Now, to do what I'm talking about, though, you have to choose the King James translation. This only works in Blue Letter Bible with the King James. When you type in that passage, King James Version, click on it. And it will come up with the King James Version, but beside every word will be a little number. If it's in the New Testament, it will be a number with a G in front, standing for Greek. Greek, and then a number. In the Old Testament, it'll be an H in front of it, Hebrew, and then the number. And then if you just click on that number, it will give you the meaning of that word and all the places in the New Testament or the Old Testament where that word is used, no matter how it's translated into English. In fact, it'll tell you all the different ways it's been translated into English, and then it'll give you a list of all the passages, and it'll actually give you the verse in which it occurs. And then, of course, you can take that list and go to different translations and see how they translate the word. So, for instance, if you type in John chapter 1, which begins in the beginning, if you are in the King James, beside the word beginning will be a little number, G746. Click on that word, and you will find the meaning of that word, and then all the places in the New Testament where that Greek word is used. And that's one of the very important ways, I think, of studying to really find out what a word means, to see the different ways that it is used. You kind of get a, an understanding of the whole field, the semantic field of how that word can be used. And often it will then become helpful as you read in a particular verse to see what the author might have meant. It's also helpful to see how different authors use the word because it may be in some words that, say, Paul and John will use the word differently. So that's a great source, blueletterbible.org, and go to King James. By the way, I, I missed one step. When you have the verse come up in the King James, it won't have those little numbers. Well, hello again. My internet went out for a minute, so we went blank there. I hope you're back with me now. Um, sorry about that. It just went blank and uh, said my internet was gone, but now it's back. 
what I was just telling you, to get those strong numbers, those little numbers beside the King James, you do have to go up. There's a whole line, a little tab, line of tabs along the top, and press Strong's. Just click on Strong's, and then all those numbers will appear beside each word. So go to a passage, pick the King James Version, have it come up, go up to the top, click on Strong's, and then all those numbers will appear, and you can use it as a concordance to find out all the different places where a given word. I was just saying that, for instance, if you were to take John 1 in the beginning, once you click that Strong's tab, then there will be a number beside each word. The number beside beginning will be G746. Just click on that and you'll see all the places where that word in Greek is used in the New Testament. Now, another important thing as we think about the use of words is thinking of the common, ordinary, secular ways that words were used, that were used as analogies for theological ideas and theological words. You see, very few of the words that we think of as theological terms were actually theological terms to begin with. They were ordinary everyday terms that were used then as an analogy for theology or for theological purposes. Let me give you an example, show you what I mean. The term redemption. When we think of redemption, we think of it as a theological word, redeem, how I love to proclaim it. But we seldom think of the picture that is behind that word. Almost every word that we think of as a theological term has a picture behind it. The picture of redemption is setting free a prisoner or a slave. It's used mostly for slaves. About a third of the population were slaves in the New Testament days. And there was a lot of setting free of slaves. Many masters would set their slaves free in their will when they uh, died. And so a slave would then be set free. And there was actually a little service where slaves were set free. That was redemption, setting free. Actually, the term is used in that kind of secular way within the New Testament. For instance, Hebrews 11, talking about all those great people of faith. And it says there were others who were tortured, refusing to be set free so that they might gain an even better resurrection. In other words, people who didn't give up their faith, even though being tortured, they refused to be set free, it says. Matthew 27, 15, at the crucifixion. We read now the at the festival, that is at Passover, the governor, who of course was Pontius Pilate, was accustomed to release or set free a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. And of course, they chose Barabbas to be set free. So the term redemption really means setting free. So when you think of it, it becomes much more meaningful when you read through the New Testament. If when you find that term, it's not just kind of an abstract theological term, but it is a real live term. You have a picture in your mind. You think of a slave being set free, and you realize that what Jesus did for us on the cross was to set us free from all that shackled us. Understanding the backgrounds of words, how rich they are, is also important, and here commentaries, and again, dictionaries will help. Um, there are terms, for instance, in the Old Testament that are just almost impossible to translate by one single word. In the Sabbath school lesson this week, one of those was the term chesed. The Hebrew word chesed had a whole um, array of meanings that you just can't capture with one word. 
Chesed was the loving loyalty that kept you faithful to covenants that you had made. So you have made a covenant. Life was seen in terms of covenants. And you've made a covenant. And what is it that keeps you faithful to that covenant? It's a kind of commitment. It's a kind of loyalty. It's a love. So how do you translate all of that into just one English word? Well, you really can't do it. So there are different ways that chesed is translated in different translations. <coughs> Pardon me. Some translations will just say loyalty. Some will say love. Some will say steadfast love. Some will say loving kindness. But if you go back and understand the, the whole picture behind that word, why it makes your study richer. So understanding the words. One more element in understanding the words. A lot of times there are word plays. And of course, a word play doesn't translate very easily. So here you'll have to rely on commentaries to let you know some of those things that do enrich understanding. Uh, for instance, in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You don't really get the full idea of that in English because in Hebrew, it has a lot of alliteration. It's putting words together that sound the same. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem is Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. There's not all the SHs in there. Uh, sometimes writers use word plays and use words that sound alike to make a point. For instance, Amos chapter 5, verse 18. God shows Amos a basket of summer fruit. And he says, Amos, what do you see? And he says, I see a basket of summer fruit. And God says, okay, I'm going to talk to you about the end. Well, now, what do those two things have to do with each other? Basket of summer fruit and end. Well, in the original language, in Hebrew, a basket of summer fruit is keats. An end is kates. Keats, kates. The two words sound almost identical. And so it becomes logical that the basket of summer fruit could be used as a symbol for the end. Uh, but you don't catch that unless you understand it in the original language. And so again, some of those kinds of things you have to rely on commentaries to see. But it is important to understand the words. And it just becomes more meaningful if you even understand some of those word plays, for instance. Okay, so today we have talked about holistic understanding. Understanding it orally, holistically, as the original hearers would have. We've talked about the words. Now I want to move on and talk about historical and cultural background. And I can see we're not going to get through all of this today. We'll carry over. We're supposed to move on to creation next week, according to our quarterly. And we'll get there by the end of next week. But we're going to have to spend a little bit of time uh, continuing on what we've done today. Because I'm not going to get through what I want to say about uh, different principles of interpretation. So we've talked about holistic understanding. We've talked about the words. I want to talk about understanding historical and cultural background. You know, sometimes if you don't have a little bit of background, you don't really understand what's going on. Another example from my book, Enjoying Your Bible. Uh, back when I only had two grandsons, I now have three. But I had two, and there was a member of our church who worked in wood. And one of the things he did was make these antique toys out of wood. And they were beautiful. He made tractors 
and I decided that both of my grandsons needed one of these tractors. Now, at the time I was living in California, one grandson was in Seattle, the other was in Spokane. So I bought a tractor for both of my grandsons. I didn't send it to them. I wanted to give it to them in person. And we were making a trip up to see them both. We flew first to Seattle, then over to Spokane, made a triangle, and then back home to California. So when I gave the tractor to my Seattle grandson, the first thing he did was flip it over and say, tractor tipping. A couple days later, when we flew to Spokane, I gave my other grandson the tractor. And the first thing he did was tip it over and say, tractor tipping. Now, if you didn't have a little bit of background, you would really scratch your head and wonder, what in the world? Why did these two, totally separately from each other, do the same thing? And why would they do such a thing? And how do you make sense out of that? Well, one piece of background information would make it clear. You see, both of them were big fans of the movie Cars, which was popular at that time. And in the movie Cars, there's a scene where they go out and tip over tractors and say tractor tipping. And since they were both big fans of Cars, it's the first thing they thought of when I gave them a tractor. And once you understand that little bit of background, what they did becomes absolutely clear. But without that, you would scratch your head and wonder what was going on. Well, I think the same thing is true sometimes of the Bible. If we have just a little bit of background and understand what's happening, why well, then the actions become clear. Another example. This is an example I've used in classes where I'm teaching New Testament. And um, we're talking about interpretation and principles of interpretation. And I have said, listen, I'm going to show you some things that have nothing to do with the Bible and that we don't believe are inspired. But I just want you to figure out what are some of the principles you would use if you wanted to interpret what these things meant back when they were originally published and if they might have any continuing significance for today. And so what I picked was a whole series of political cartoons from the 1960s during the civil rights era. And I was teaching at, at La Sierra University at the time when I did this, while I was pastoring in California. And it was a very cosmopolitan group of students. There were lots of American students, but there were also lots of students who were immigrants from different parts of the world. And so here's one cartoon that I showed them. It is a picture of an African-American soldier and he is in a foxhole. He has a helmet on and he's reading a letter. And as he reads the letter, you see tears coming down his cheeks. And you see a sign that this is Vietnam. So this is in the 60s, it's the Vietnam War. He's in a foxhole in Vietnam. And you don't see what the letter says. You just see the postmark up at the top. It's Selma, Alabama, and the title is A Letter from the Home Front. Now, some of my students will immediately find that image very powerful. And others of my students would scratch their head and wonder what it was all about. 
because they really didn't know much about Vietnam and they had no idea what happened in Selma, Alabama. But if you know the history that during the Vietnam War in Selma, Alabama, there was that huge confrontation where civil rights marchers led by Dr. King were attacked with dogs and big fire hoses, some of them beaten. John Lewis, who is a member of Congress today, was almost beaten to death on the steps of the courthouse. And so the image is here of an African-American soldier fighting for his country in Vietnam and shedding tears over what has happened back at home in Selma, Alabama. So once students understood, it had a completely different meaning. But if you didn't know about Vietnam and you didn't know about Selma, Alabama, you wouldn't understand what that meant. Once a person understands what it means, I, I asked them, this was a long time ago. Um, would there still be any way that an image like this would have meaning for today, even though there's no more Vietnam War. Most of the students found it very powerful and talked about ways that it does speak to some of the issues and problems that we still face today in our society. So you see how in both of these examples, understanding something of the historical background made a difference in understanding. I remember a student coming to me one time and he said, I am going to write a term paper and I wanted to get you to give me some help with sources. I'm writing it for a history class and my topic is, was the Apostle Paul influenced by Hellenistic culture? Was the Apostle Paul influenced by Hellenistic culture? Well, I had to tell him that would be like asking, have I been influenced by American culture? Well, of course I have. I dress like an American. Much of what I do is because I've grown up in this culture. And yet it isn't my only culture. I'm also part of a subculture. I'm part of a Seventh-day Adventist subculture, which means that there are some things that are very much a part of most American culture that I don't do. And the same was true of Paul. He grew up in Hellenistic culture. He actually wasn't born in Palestine. He was born in Tarsus, which would be present-day Turkey, but which was a very Hellenized city. Hellenism it was, of course, that Greek culture that was spread around the Mediterranean world by Alexander the Great, the Greek culture. Paul grew up in a city where there was a huge amphitheater with sports. Even in Palestine, there were cities that had Greek gymnasiums and amphitheaters and theaters. So yes, Hellenistic culture was part of the day and Really, to understand the New Testament, you need to understand something about Hellenistic culture. However, Paul was not only influenced by Hellenistic culture, he could also challenge many aspects of Hellenistic culture. And he did. For instance, the sexual mores of much of the Hellenistic culture of his day. He challenges in his writings. You read Plutarch, a younger contemporary of Paul, and he says things such as you would never hear Paul say. He says, for instance, women, you must be absolutely faithful to your husband and never stray and have an affair with another man. However, you should be tolerant if your husband chooses to uh, share some of his debauchery with a mistress. Uh, don't let that concern you. 
And he also gives advice that, you know, if you're going to go to a prostitute, make sure you go to a licensed prostitute. This is not anything Paul would say. So yes, Paul was a part of Hellenistic culture, but he also challenged that culture. So understanding something of the culture of the day is important as well. When you understand some things that were going on at the time, it makes what happens in the New Testament much clearer. When Paul talks about being subject to each other out of reverence for Christ, and then talks about women's, women to their husbands, but then husbands to their wives and love them as their own bodies and be willing to give their life for it. Very different from so much of the advice that was given at the time, which was husbands, control your wife, control your children, control your slaves, because you will be dishonored. You will have shame on you if you don't control those under your authority, and you are the authority. What Paul does is much more mutual than that. Um, the book of Revelation. In Revelation 5, John is weeping because there's no one who can open the scroll that is in the hands of the one sitting on the throne. And this scroll seems to be human inheritance. The inheritance of salvation. And no one can open it. But then he hears that there is someone who can open it. A lion from the tribe of Judah. Ah, good news. Now, the lion was used in literature of the day to refer to the Messiah. So when he hears there's a lion from the tribe of Judah who will open it, this is good news. The Messiah can do it. But then when he looks, he sees instead a slain lamb. What's going on there? Well, if you don't understand how the lion was used as the symbol of the Messiah, you don't catch what's happening. That the whole definition of Messiah is being reinterpreted. Jesus didn't simply come as a lion to overthrow the Romans, but he came as one who would give his life as the sacrificial lamb for others. For understanding the history and the culture of the New Testament times, there's a book that ju has just come out that is really a marvelous book. Um, you need to do a little weight lifting before you buy this book because you will need the strength to be able to lift it. It's one of the heaviest books for its size I've ever seen. But it is called The New Testament in Its World, written by N.T. Wright, who is the most famous New Testament scholar on the planet. He is an Anglican. He has been an Anglican bishop, in fact. He's been a member of the House of Lords, and he's probably written more on the New Testament than anyone else in the last uh, several decades. This book, as I say, it is thick, it is a heavy book, and it's called The New Testament in Its World. He comes from an Anglican background, as I say, is very much an active Anglican, has been a bishop until just recently. Um, but this, you will not agree with everything you find in this book, but it's a treasure trove of information about the New Testament and its world. There are about 1,500 pictures in it. Uh, it gives you the history of the times of the New Testament, the, what was going on in the Greco-Roman world, what was going on in the Jewish world. It sets all the different New Testament writers within their worlds, and it's just an excellent resource. Now, it's 986 pages, so you probably won't just sit down and read it in an evening, but it's a great reference tool. And uh, I would strongly advise it or uh, strongly recommend it for uh, background information on the New Testament and its world. Well, I think I better stop there because uh, 
we have the worship service coming up in a few minutes. I want to continue on with some more things about the background and history and how it helps us interpret next week. And then I want to go on to the literary context and how understanding literary context helps us interpret the New Testament. And then we will get into next week's lesson as well, which has to do with creation. So we'll play a little catch up next week. Uh, we'll be on again at 10. In just a few minutes at 11, we'll be on with a worship service with a children's story and a sermon. And we'll be continuing our series on the book of Job. I hope you'll join us in a few minutes at 11 o'clock. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us so many tools and so much information that helps us make the Bible come alive. But most of all, we know that it is your spirit that makes it come alive in our hearts. And we pray that whenever we open it, your spirit will be transforming us to become more like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us.